hopefully any moment, Luca will be joining me on stage. Um, if not, I will continue uh, treading water. Um, oh, Luca, hello. How are you doing? Can you hear me? We certainly can. Welcome to API Days. Thank you, you had a few technical hitches there, but we seem to be um, loud and proud. Um, I'm going to hand over very, very quickly to you. So first of all, welcome and thank you. And if you could start to get your slides up, um, as soon as they're up, I'll let you know, and then I'll disappear, yeah? So That's hopefully good. this part will be a lot easier for you. There we go, it seems to be all happening. I can see your slides, which means the audience can do too. So good luck, and thank you very much, Luca. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so just a quick introduction from my side. Um, I'm uh, Luca Ferrari, I'm an EMEA solution architect from Red Hat. I was originally working for an API management <clears throat> startup here in Barcelona. Uh, and uh, I'm a, a long time presenter of API days. I uh, highly enjoyed this, uh, this set of conferences. And I think it's, uh, it's always a, a great way to collaborate on the uh, API topic. So uh, the session of today, for me, it's about um, why your digital identity is uh, super critical in a uh, post-COVID world. So um, basically we will see what has been the impact of the pandemic uh, in terms of uh, payment and uh, digital transactions. We've seen some challenges that were introduced even before uh, this pandemic and how uh, the effect of, uh, of these uh, challenges was uh, highly amplified by, by COVID. Um, we'll see what is SSI and how it is built. I'll not uh, disclose the acronym yet. Um, and then we'll see some practical examples of uh, using this uh, type of uh, framework. So as I was mentioning before, um, some of the effect that we are seeing in terms of uh, financial uh, transactions and uh, consumption and in general uh, user spending uh, were there even before the pandemic. So we were seeing a shift for the uh, Y or Z, Z generation to electronic payments, uh, more and more usage of e-commerce. Again, depending on the on the geo that you are, it, uh, this figure, this percentage might might change. Um, but this pandemic clearly brought, first of all, a, a general decrease in terms of uh, spending. Um, we saw also a decrease uh, in cash usage because it is uh, well known that it could be a possible source of uh, infection and clearly an increase in all that is uh, digital wire transfer, peer-to-peer uh, -peer transfer, and uh, any form of digital payment. And we saw this not only in the developed world. So as we can see here, even a uh, less developed country or less uh, uh, banked country experienced an increase in uh, this set of uh, uh, digital uh, financial services. Uh, all of this is still happening while we see uh, uh, an increased trend for uh, credit card uh, frauds and in general uh, fraud online. Uh, this uh, is a trend that's uh, been there for some years now. And clearly the fact that now more and more activities are uh, have to be uh, concluded online so from loans to other type of uh, long process means that there is even more opportunity for uh, fraud to to happen this also goes hand in hand with the fact that uh, data breaches are happening every week uh, i think we all can remember uh, Equifax uh, breach um, and 
this is critical because uh, if um, if joined with uh, an increased amount and risk of uh, of frauds, it brings us to a situation where your digital identity is really at risk every day. And uh, when we think also of data breaches, so one thing I, I want to highlight is the fact that uh, we don't have to think that a malicious user will just uh, steal or find all the information needed in one place. Uh, more and more we'll see um, some fraudulent uh, usage by uh, building synthetic profiles. So basically by collating uh, information coming from different data breaches by a malicious user and building a fake identity, which is uh, similar to a, to a uh, real one, and that bank or financial institution will accept for such thing as uh, loans or, or credit cards. And of course, as we can see here in the top uh, 10 list of um, uh, of where uh, we we are experiencing identity theft. Clearly, we see uh, the impact on financial industry again. So we see at first uh, at in first position clearly credit card fraud, uh, and uh, third and fourth position uh, loan and bank fraud. So clearly, financial institution need to uh, look out there. Uh, every day, um, even more right now. So if we want to sum up what we've seen uh, in terms of uh, trends and, uh, and numbers, clearly we've seen a, an uptick in the usage of cards uh, in uh, uh, touchless uh, <clears throat> RFID payment. Also an increased usage of digital wallets uh, which is also related to more and more opportunities for uh, embedded finance to, to take a bigger share uh, of uh, the consumer spending. We also see some uh, reduced fees from banks to help stimulate a little bit uh, the consumption in these difficult times. And in some ways, an opportunity for fintech to even disrupt more uh, the financial market. Um, so in terms of negative, so uh, elements that are really maybe preventing a little bit the the usage of uh, or the improvements to uh, digital identity, we see less investment clearly available uh, from banks uh, because uh, they, they have to maybe forego part of the budget given the uh, uh, the decrease in revenue, less consumption from uh, from the users, and uh, actually, uh, as I was mentioning before, it's a perfect storm condition for uh, fraud to be happening, where uh, the user is remote. Uh, maybe he uh, need to be verified only through a phone call, and the bank is trying to or the financial institution start to just um, basically put off the fire without uh, having a more radical approach to uh, digital identity. And uh, as I was mentioning before, um, also regulation it was bringing already new challenges to uh, the financial institution table. Uh, so with PSD2, we've seen that everything has to be exposed uh, through an API, at least uh, publicly, and anybody can be a, a, a TPP. This means that uh, clearly we have more chances for digital identity theft and forging. Um, and part of the uh, regulation included the fact that banks have to adopt a fraud management system uh which uh, might be paired with also risk-based authentication uh where once again the digital identity is critical and one important element that uh, i think it's not really well specified and uh, at the moment is still not fully implemented 
uh, is the concept management. So the whole part where uh, an end user can actually <clears throat> revoke and, and see uh, where he is given uh, access to part of uh, its financial data or uh, has have uh, approved some uh, payments. GDR, uh, GDPR is also bringing uh, lots of challenges to, to this table uh, with the need to uh, trace user identities everywhere. And again, uh, the issue of uh, uh, organic consent management. So let's introduce a little bit uh, SSI. Um, so if you think about the last time you uh, rented an apartment, um, I'm pretty sure you can remember the whole load of uh, bureaucracy you have to go through, uh, the exchange of uh, documents, maybe the, the statement that you had to get from the bank uh, to the rental agency, uh, the way the agency, sorry, uh, the way the agency uh, was uh, storing the documents in a uh, possibly not super safe way. Um, and the fact that uh, most likely the whole process uh, took at least a week. So with SSI, uh, you can achieve this, uh, this whole process maintaining the same actors in place, uh, more or less maintaining the same flow. So there's still an exchange of uh, identities and of uh, uh, proofs, but it's all going to be digital. It's all going to be verifiable. Um, it's all going to be uh, safe. Um, and um, it's all going to be, let, let's just say, uh, privacy oriented and efficient. Um, so in, in some ways, um, this is the same problem that was solved uh, originally by issuing official uh, identity documents uh, like a passport or a, a driving license. So this in the physical world uh, represent you and um, they are uh, an easy way for a human to verify that uh, uh, you are who you are. In some sense, SSI uh, does the same. Uh, so without relying on any uh, third party, uh, but uh, it is a, let's just say a passport on steroids because it has all the uh, security of uh, PKI uh, infrastructure. So, uh, I've been dropping this SSI acronym a couple of times. Uh, maybe you're confused. Uh, well, you shouldn't be being in the IT world. We are not happy if we don't have at least two or three acronyms here and there. So basically, um, self-sovereign identity, uh, which um, is uh, mainly uh, the, the, the centerpiece of which is um, the decentralized identifier uh, can be described as uh, a lifetime portable identity that uh, here I want to highlight the fact that does not depend on, on any central authority and can never be taken away, which means that uh, even expired identities uh, will still uh, um, be able to be verified in the future. Uh, in a safe and reproducible way um, while not depending on any third party like uh, uh, Google or any other federated identity party. So let's do a quick recap of uh, which kind of identity model are there and you have at the moment. So there is the centralized one or the siloed one where you're basically registering your account onto an organization this uh, might include uh, username and password with the optional uh, uh, two-factor authentication. Then you have the federated identity. So this typically translates in um, all those situations where, for example, you're uh, registering yourself through a, a third party like uh, Google or Facebook. 
Um, and this simplifies a little bit uh, the set of credentials that you have to memorize clearly, but uh, is not really suitable for uh, higher grade um, uh, security uh, or uh, sensitive services. And in most of the cases, when you create the account, you still uh, need to add additional uh, security question to prove uh, that you are who you are. And then uh, finally, self-sovereign identity. So in this case, there's no third party. You're connecting directly to a peer uh, and you're identified by uh, a DID, uh, so a decentralized identifier, which is uh, saved uh, onto a distributed ledger, uh, typically blockchain, uh, which means that it cannot be corrupted uh, and it can be verified uh, at any point in time. Um, so why uh, blo blockchain? Uh, as, I, as I was saying before, it's distributed, which means that uh, there are several nodes in the network that can verify you and it cannot be uh, corrupted. Um, so as you can see in this enhanced flow, there are several elements to uh, the self-sovereign identity. So we have uh, the DID, which is the decentralized identity, which is basically uh, an ID uh, associated to, um, which uh, exemplifies an identity you have with one of the issuer. Um, then you have the decentralized uh, key management system, which is typically the digital wallet, which provides uh, also system to recover uh, your identity. And then you have uh, the mechanism to actually proving uh, that you hold uh, or that you are who you are, which is proving the deed uh, through a mechanism of uh, public and private uh, key. So how would I use in practice uh, self-sovereign identity? So this is one of the scenarios that uh, you will be able to find uh, on one of uh, the, the service provider that already are implementing this SSI uh, service. And in this case, um, Alice is uh, applying for a job. And the critical element here is that uh, that makes all the difference is the fact that um, Acme Corporation doesn't have to contact directly uh, the college uh, or Alice again to request proof of uh, their study. And Alice is always aware in her digital wallet of all the um, DIT, uh, so the identities that uh, she has. Um, and all the transactions um, that uh, allow to store and verify uh, digital identity are done on the distributed ledger uh, in a safe way. So as we can see, the the whole process is much more efficient uh, and much more uh, secure. So the same goes as an extended use case uh, for applying for a, for a loan. So again, in this case, typically the, the bank with, will try to verify the, uh, <clears throat> the credit score or some other uh, attribute. Um, with Alice and she doesn't have to present anything. Um, the bank can verify uh, once, once Alice has provided uh, the, uh, the, her deed related to uh, the application for a loan, uh, the bank can verify this to the distributed ledger. So there is an optional demo I, I left the the link in the in the slide so when when you receive the slide you can also go yourself through this scenario uh, through the web browser clearly there are some challenges in this model so the first one is that uh, since the digital wallet is typically uh, on your mobile phone um, this is a single point of uh, attack for a malicious user so there should be in place some mechanism to protect your uh, your smartphone. This doesn't mean that the digital wallet uh, is your 
a smartphone. So you you will still have a way to, like any other app, to revoke uh, smartphone access to the digital wallet. Uh, but clearly, uh, there is a strong relationship between the two. And then we have, of course, as always, uh, as in any API and integration scenario, the standards issue. So at the moment, the um, the regulation, well, the, the standards are still consolidating. And for example, in the case of uh, the distributed ledger, there are several ways or several standards to implement that. So there are several entities, uh, W3C and uh, OpenID, uh, a foundation that are working on on this topic but we still haven't really converged on this uh, the same goes for the digital wallet uh, so uh, we're still waiting for a consolidation what are the practical implications so what are the improvements we uh, i will say we will see hopefully in the in the next uh, couple of years um we all been there where you are uh, logged in through maybe facebook uh, onto a service or linkedin or whatever and then you're still asked this extra security question uh, which are always uh, kind of weird and random and you can never remember the answer unless you written down the answer somewhere and that's all because um, the service cannot really verify in an easy way <clears throat> who you are. So they're trying to leverage what you know, basically. So this will be solved with uh, decentralized identity. And we will tackle a lot of the points we, we see here. So for example, anything from, um, from preventing a lot of the phishing attacks where uh, you cannot really verify who's the third party uh identity or third party authority who's contacting you um to moving for example all e-government or government or uh, state uh, services to the internet uh, so a lot of a lot of procedures and um, uh, documents that you you are requiring at least in spain or italy have to go through a, a, a lot of paperwork, queues and uh, appointments. Uh, so that's that's really painful. Um, to even improving the speed of any type of uh, onboarding. So whether it's uh, opening a bank account, we're seeing already some examples of, of this with uh, neo banks uh, or uh, even ensuring access to financial service for those that are unbanked. So in those cases, you would just need uh, your digital wallet, um, which has already an identity, and uh, your government ID, and, and that's it. So this will also clearly affect PSD2. So you will typically have two scenario, one where you get a clearer and reliable view on what information is being used and, and when in terms of um, payment, third party payment service provider. Uh, and you also have a much easier way to revoke the right to, uh, to this information or to this part of information. And then the same will be valid for uh, ASP. So in the in the case of sharing account and transaction information. The other advantage of using this model is the fact that you can share uh, a claim. So just a part of the information, uh, it doesn't have to be all the transaction. It can be just, uh, for example, uh, whether the, the balance was higher than 5,000 euros in the last month or something like that. And in some ways, uh, SSI is already here. So for this is an example, uh, you will find the, the source at the bottom of the slide. So MyCash is a, My Cash Money is a remittance service in Malaysia, and they're already using Onfido, which is a, um, a decentralized identity service to uh, power their, their service with um, uh, verifiable 
uh, way for users to actually get access to the money or or send money and these users which are mostly unbanked uh, would need just their digital wallet and uh, government issued ID and that's it so I guess that's it if you want to connect on this you will you can scan the QR code and um, yeah Luca thank you very very much that was worth your persistence at the beginning thank you uh, we do have one question uh, before we wrap up, and that is from Andrew. So, Andrew Souden, thank you very much. Now, this is the question. Does the UK model of not having single ID document um, a thorn in the side of digital platforms? And he goes on to say, I use Yachty for client ID checks, but our government made a massive mistake by cancelling the ID card project in 2010. So the question is, does the, I, does the UK model of not having a single ID document, is that a thorn in the side for digital platforms? Um, so I guess this all goes down again to uh, the issue I was mentioning around standards. Um, and luckily, we sometimes lack standards in the physical world as well. Um, we face the same issue kind of in Italy, where uh, there was um, uh, the discussion around merging the social security card with the um, national ID card, and then the project got stuck for like uh, uh, some years. So I guess for now, um, the most reliable way would be to to use the passport. I've I've already uh, tried, and you can try as well. There's a service called uh, Global ID which is already trying to implement uh, DID and SSI. And for most of uh, these identities, you start from uh, uh, the passport. And that's, uh, at the moment, at least, it's the easiest way to do that. Luca, thank you very much. And your colleague has just put online in the chat uh, that you um, is yep. encouraging everybody to hang out with you in the in the virtual, in, in the virtual uh, booth. So I will... Uh, share that with everybody too. Luca, thank you very, very much. Um, a, a brilliant presentation and thank you for persisting with the technology at the beginning.